internet, this is Jacob Clifford and welcome to my YouTube channel. Now let's go back in time. It's December of 1799 and the first American president, George Washington, is sick. You're the doctor and given the limited access you have to medical research, you prescribe bloodletting. So you confidently remove five pints of his blood. Five pints. And the result? Well, he dies later that night. Bummer. Okay, let's do this again, except it's October of 1929, and you're not a doctor, you're an economist. The stock market just crashed, leading to a global economic collapse. So what do you do? What medicine do you prescribe? What steps do you take, and will they make things better or worse? Most people have absolutely no clue, but not you. You understand economics. Okay, I promised to go back and talk about the Great Depression, but first, let's cover some key concepts. Now, all the things you learned in Unit 1 are covered in both a micro and a macroeconomics class, but in Unit 2, we're diving fully into macroeconomics, the study of the overall economy. And the single most important concept in all of macroeconomics is GDP, gross domestic product. It's the value of everything the country produces in a year. GDP was developed in the early part of the Great Depression as a systematic way to measure the health of the economy. So going with this whole doctor and medicine analogy, GDP is a vital sign of the economy. It's like the heartbeat. The textbook definition is that GDP is the dollar value of all final goods and services produced in a country's border in one year. Notice there's some details there. First, it's the dollar value, so it's measured in dollars. It's not measured in the number of chickens and cars and pizzas we can produce. And it only includes final goods and services. So a tomato does count if it's bought by the end consumer, but if it's purchased by a business to be put into a pizza, then that tomato doesn't count towards GDP. That's called an intermediate good, doesn't count. GDP looks at production within the country, and it doesn't matter who owns the company or the factory. If it's produced in the United States, that counts towards the US GDP. And lastly, it's measured each year, so this allows us to see if the economy is growing over time and to see if specific policies are working. Now, one of the things your teacher or professor is going to talk about is the three ways to measure GDP. There's the expenditures approach, the income approach, and the value added approach. All three should give you the same exact number, they're just different ways of looking at it. The first one, the expenditures approach, looks at all the purchases made on goods and services produced in the United States in a given year. It focuses on purchases. And it turns out there's only four entities that can purchase things in the economy. Either consumers, that's consumer spending, by businesses, that's investment spending, by the government, that's government spending, and by other countries, that's the idea of net exports. Exports minus import. And together this creates the most important equation in all of macroeconomics. GDP equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And the second way of coming up with the same number is looking at all the income earned by all those purchases. And that's the income approach. Every single person's spending is somebody else's income and that should result in the same number. In a macro class, the income approach isn't used as much as the expenditures approach, but it does have its own equation. National income equals wages plus rents plus interest plus profit. These represent all the different sources of income from selling all the goods and services in a given year the GDP. It feels like I'm doing a lot with my fingers in this episode. I don't know. A lot of lists. And the third way of coming up with the GDP is the value added approach, which involves just adding up the value added at each stage of the production process. I think all three of these will make more sense if I just give you some examples. So for simplicity, let's just say we're selling hats. Cacti! So the only thing being produced in the entire country is just one hat and it cost me three dollars to get the yarn for the hat and I sell the hat for $10. So if you buy the hat from me, that's considered consumer spending, that's part of the expenditures approach, and the GDP is $10. Notice we don't count the $3 for the yarn because that's an intermediate good. We just count the value of the final good. Notice that using the income approach, the GDP is still $10, right? If I earn $7 from selling you the hat, that's $7 towards national income. Plus the $3 earned by the guy who sold me the yarn, he earned $3, seven plus three, $10. And the third one, the value added approach is like the same thing except in reverse. So the person that converted the raw cotton into yarn added $3 of value to it when he sold it to me for $3. Then I converted that yarn into a hat that I sold for $10. So we converted adding another seven. So they added three, I added seven for a total of 10. Does that make sense? Now every time I teach GDP, there's always some student that asks some ridiculous question like, well, what if you're making the hats but you're crossing the border and you're in the airport but you bought the yarn from a guy from Canada but you sold it to a guy in Mexico but you sold it to him on the plane but you hadn't taken off yet? Like, 
No. Don't get bogged down by all the details. Your teacher or professor is going to ask you questions about does this or does this count towards GDP, but it's not going to be that complicated. Just make sure you understand what GDP is, the three ways to measure it, and what things count and what things don't count towards GDP. Things that don't count are like intermediate goods. These are things that are used to produce the final good. They don't count in GDP. We also don't count used goods. Things were produced in previous years don't count towards today's GDP. Financial transactions don't count towards GDP because nothing new was produced. So if you buy stocks or bonds from somebody, that doesn't count towards GDP. And government spending counts towards GDP, but transfer payments don't count towards GDP. The point here is you have to understand what counts and what doesn't count, which means that you're going to have to do some practice. So as always, at the end of this video, I gave you some practice, multiple choice questions to make sure you're actually getting it. But before we do that, we're going to have to do this. This is the circular flow model, and at first glance, it seems super confusing, but I promise you, it's not that hard. It's gonna make sense. It better. Okay, pause. Now, if you've already seen this, you understand the circular flow model, then keep watching this video, but if you haven't, pause this video, go watch the other video that I made explaining the entire circular flow, then come back and watch this video. I'm assuming that you've seen this, and if you haven't, you're gonna be totally lost, so make sure you understand the circular flow. Do you see how the circular flow model shows both the expenditures approach to GDP and the income approach to calculating GDP? The expenditures approach focuses on all that spending and the income approach focuses on, well, the income. But because I was trying to keep things simple, I didn't include one of the most important parts of the economy, the financial sector. This shows how private savings, which is savings by individual households, and public savings, which is savings by the government, how it's lent out to businesses and individuals in the government to make purchases. Okay, now let's go back and look at the Great Depression. Now, it turns out that the bloodletting that killed George Washington was the same thing that killed the economy in the 1930s. The lifeblood of the economy is money. If there's no money, there's no savings, there's no lending, there's no spending, and the whole economy will just shrivel up. And that's exactly what happened during the Great Depression. The Federal Reserve didn't stop the bleeding and the money supply decreased by 35%. In fact, years later, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, said, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry, we won't do it again. Bummer. As you know, each episode I add something to the wall behind me to help you remember the key concept. So, to help you remember the idea of the circular flow, C, I, and G, and the idea of the financial sector, we have Lightning McQueen consumer spending, Tomater, which is business spending or investment, and of course, the Sheriff, which is government spending. So right here are the three parts of a closed economy and the circular flow model. By the way, if you haven't already seen it, I made an Econ Movies episode using cars as the example to talk about recessions and growth the economy and GDP, you should check it out. And to remind you about bloodletting and George Washington, the Great Depression, the whole idea of the financial sector being the lifeblood to the economy, I have this, a vial of my own blood. No, not really, it's just some water with some food coloring. What do you think, I'm crazy? Okay, now you need to practice, so it's time for a pop quiz. Because GDP is so darn important, there's two things we're gonna do to practice for this video. First, you're gonna fill out this chart, so you're gonna use the words in the word bank to figure out where each one of these things are, and it's gonna prove that you understand the circular flow. To download and print the PDF, all you have to do is sign up for the free trial of my ultimate review packet. It's right there in unit two, and the answer key is in there as well. So the link is in the description below. Just follow that link. That's how you get this PDF. And second, I added some multiple choice questions about what counts and doesn't count in GDP to the end of this video, but keep in mind, they won't be on the screen for very long, so you have to pause the video, answer the questions, then look in the comments below for the answer key. As always, thank you so much for watching my videos. Please like and subscribe. Good luck on these quizzes and on filling out the circular flow model. Until next time.